Chapter 3 Magic and Religion Andrew, Goddess of the Hunt Hear me, sons and daughters of the people. I am sister of the moon, mother of hers, lady of the hunt, and royal. Remember my teachings, remember the Virdala Tanadal. The way of three trees that I have given you. Vir Asan, the way of the arrow, be swift and silent. Strike true, do not waver, and let not your prey suffer. That is my way. Vir Borasan, the way of the bow. As the sapling bends, so must you. In yielding, find resilience. In pliancy, find strength. That is my way. Vir Adalem, the way of the wood. Receive the gifts of the hand with mindfulness. Respect the sacrifice of my children. Know that your passing shall nourish them in turn. That is my way. Remember the ways of the hunter, and I shall be with you. From the charge of Andruil, goddess of the hunt. Dirfanen, keeper of secrets. The twins Falondin and Dirfanen are the eldest children of Elgernon, the old father, and Mithil, the protector. The brothers were inseparable from the moment of their conception, known for their great love of each other. That is why we often speak of Falondin in one breath and the Dirfamen the next, for they cannot bear the yet to be apart, not even in our tales. When the world was young, the gods often walked the earth, and Falondin and Dirfamen were no exception. Both were delighted by the many wonders of our earth. They played with the animals, whispered to the trees, and bathed in the lakes and streams. Their days were filled with bliss, and they did not know sorrow. And then one day, while passing through the forest, Falondin and Dirfamen came across an old and sickly deer resting beneath a tree. Why do you sit so still, little sister? asked Falondin. Play with us said Dirfamen. Alas, spoke the deer, I cannot. I am old, and although I wish to go to my rest, my legs can no longer carry me. Taking pity on the deer, Falandine gathered her up into her arms and carried her to her rest beyond the veil. Dirfamen tried to follow them, but the shifting grey paths beyond the veil would not let him. Separated for the first time from Falandine, Dirfamen wandered aimlessly till he came across two ravens. You are lost, and soon you will fade, the raven named Fear said to Dirfamen. Your brother has abandoned you. He no longer loves you, said the other, named Deceit. I am not lost, and Falondine has not abandoned me, replied Dirfamen. He subdued the ravens and bade them carry him to Falondine. This they did for they had been defeated and were now bound to Dirfamen's service. When Dirfamen found Falondin, he found also the deer, who once again was light on her feet, for her spirit was released from her weakened body. Both Falondin and Dirfamen rejoiced to see this. Falondin vowed that he would remain to carry all the dead to their place beyond, just as he did the deer, and Dirfamen stayed with him for the twins cannot bear to be apart. From the story of Falondin and Dirfamen, as told by Gisharal, keeper of the Ralaferon clan of Dalish elves. Elgernan, god of vengeance. Long ago, when time itself was young, the only things in existence were the sun and the land. The sun, curious about the land, bowed his head close to her body and Elgernon was born in the place where they touched. The sun and the land loved Elgernon greatly, for he was beautiful and clever. As a gift to Elgernon, the land brought forth great birds of beasts and, and beasts of sky and forest, and all manner of wonderful green things. Elgernon loved his mother's gifts, and praised them highly and walked amongst them often. The sun, looking down upon the fruitful land, 
saw the joy that Algernon took in her works and grew jealous. Out of spite, he shone his face full upon all the creatures of the earth has created, and burned them all to ashes. The land cracked and split from bitterness and pain, and cried salt tears for the loss of all she had wrought. The pool of tears cried for the land become the ocean, and the cracks in her body the first rivers and streams. Elgernan was furious at what his father had done, and vowed vengeance. He lifted himself into sky the sky and wrestled the sun, determined to defeat him. They fought for eternity, and eventually the sun grew weak, while Elgernan's rage was undebated. Eventually Elgernan threw the sun down from the sky and buried him in a deep abyss created by the land's sorrow. With the sun gone, the world was covered in shadow, and all that remained in the sky were the reminders of Elgernon's battle with his father, drops of the sun's life blood, which twinkled and shimmered in darkness. From the tale of Elgernon and the sun, as told by Gisharal, keeper of the Ralatherin clan of the Dalish elves. Palondin, friend of the dead, the guide. O Falondin, Lethan Advir, friend to the dead, guide my feet, call my soul, lead me to my rest. In ancient times the people were ageless and eternal, and instead of dying would enter Euthenera, the long sleep, and walk the shifting paths beyond the veil with Falondin and his brother Durfamen. Those elders would learn the secrets of dreams and some returned to the people with newfound knowledge. But we quickened and became mortal. Those of the people who passed walked with Falondin into the beyond and never returned. If they took counsel with their hermen on their passage, his wisdom was lost, for it went with them into the beyond also, and never came to the people. Then Fen Harel caused the gods to be shut away from us, and those who passed no longer had Falondin to guide them. And so we learned to lay our loved ones to the rest with an oaken staff, to keep them from faltering along the paths, and a cedar branch, to scatter the ravens named Fear and Deceit, who were once servants of their family, now without a master. As told by Gizharel, keeper of the Ralafer clan of the Dalish Alps. Then Harel the Dread Wolf. There is precious little we know about Fen Harel, for they say he did not care for our people. Elgarnan and Mithal created the world as we know it. Andriel taught us the ways of the hunter. Silas and June gave us fire and crafting. But Fen Harel kept to himself and plotted the betrayal of all the gods. And after the destruction of Arlathan, when the gods could no longer hear our prayers, it is said that Fen Harrell spent centuries in a far corner of the earth, giggling madly and hugging himself in glee. The legend says that before the fall of Arlathan, the gods we know and revere fought an endless war with others of their kind. There is not a harem among us who remembers these others. Only in dreams we do hear whispered the names of Gelderon and Derntafal and Anaris, for they are the forgotten ones, the gods of terror and malice, spite and pestilence. In ancient times only Fen Harel could walk without fear among both our gods and the forgotten ones, for although he is kin to the gods of the people, the forgotten ones knew of his cunning ways and saw him as one of their own. And that is how Fen Harel tricked them. Our gods saw him as a brother, and they trusted him when he said that they must keep to the heavens while he arranged a truce. And the Forgotten Ones trusted him also when he said he would arrange for the defeat of our gods, if only the Forgotten Ones would return to the Abyss for a time. They trusted Fenharel, and they were all of them betrayed. And Fenharel sealed them away so they could never again walk among the people. From the tale of Fenharel's triumph, as told by Gisharel, keeper of the Ralafarin clan of the Dalish elves. Gila Nine, mother of the Hala. They say Gila Nan was one of the people, 
in the days before Arlathan, and the chosen of Andrew the Huntress. She was very beautiful, with hair of snowy white, and as graceful as a gazelle. She kept always to Andrew's ways, and Andrew favoured her above all others. One day, while hunting in the forest, Gila Nan came across a hunter she did not know. At his feet lay a hawk, shot through the heart by an arrow. Gila Nan was full with rage, for the hawk, along with her, the hare, is an animal much beloved by Andrew. Gila Nan demanded that the hunter make an offering to Andrew, in exchange for taking the life of one of her creatures. The hunter refused and Gila Nan called upon the goddess to curse him, so that he could never again hunt and kill a living creature. Gila Nan's curse took hold, and the hunter found that he was unable to hunt. His prey would dart out of sight, and his arrows would fly astray. His friends and family began to mock him for this impotence, for what use is a hunter who cannot hunt? Ashamed, the hunter swore he would find Gilanan and repay her for what she had done to him. He found Gilanan while she was out on a hunt with her sisters, and lured her away from them with lies and false words. He told Gilanan that he had learned his lesson, and begged her to come with him, so she could teach him to make a proper offering to Andruil. Moved by his plea, Gilanan followed the hunter, and when they were away from all of her sisters, the hunter turned on Gilanan. He blinded her first, and then bound her as one would bind a kill fresh from the hunt. But because he was cursed, the hunter could not kill her. Instead, he left her for dead in the forest. And Gilanan prayed to the gods for help. She prayed to Algernon for vengeance, to Mother Methal to protect her. But above all, she prayed to Andruil. Andrew sent her hairs to Gilanan, and they chewed through the ropes that bound her, but Gilanan was still wounded and blind, and could not find her way home. So Andrew turned her into a beautiful white deer, the first Hala, and Gilanan found her way back to her sisters and led them to the hunter, who was wrought to justice. And since that day the Hala have guided the people, and have never led us astray, for they listened to the voice of Gilanan. From the tale of Gilana, as told by Gisharel, keeper of the Ralaferon clan of the Dalish elves. June, god of the craft. We dedicate all of our crafts to June, for it is he who taught the people to bend the branches of trees to make our bows, and to fashion coverings of furs and iron bark. Without June, would we have the aravel or the harnesses for our hala? When the people were young, we wandered the forest without purpose. We drank from streams and ate the berries and nuts that we could find. We did not hunt, for we had no bows. We wore nothing, for we had no knowledge of spinning or needlecraft. We shivered in the cold nights and went hungry through the winters, when all, of, all the world was covered in ice and snow. Then Celeste the hearth keeper came and gave us fire and taught us how to feed it with wood. June taught us to fashion bows and arrows and knives, so that we could hunt. We learned to cook the flesh of the creatures we hunted over Celeste's fire, and we learned to clothe ourselves in their furs and skins. And the people were no longer cold and hungry. As told by Gisharal, keeper of the Ralaferon clan of the Dalish elves. Mythol the Great Protector. Elgernarn had defeated his father, the sun, and all was covered in darkness. Pleased with himself, Elgernarn sought to console his mother, the earth, by replacing all that the sun had destroyed. But the earth knew that without the sun, nothing could grow. She whispered to Elgernarn this truth, and pleaded with him to release his father, but Elgernarn's pride was great, and his vengeance was terrible and he refused. It was at this moment that Mithal walked out of the sea of, this, of the earth's tears and onto the land. She placed her hand on Elgernan's brow, and her touch, he grew calm, and knew that his anger had led him astray. Humbled, Elgernan went to the place where the sun was buried and spoke to him. 
Algernon said he would release the sun, if the sun promised to be gentle and to return to the earth each night. The sun, feeling remorse at what he had done, agreed. And so the sun rose again in the sky, and shone his golden light upon the earth. Algernon and Methal, with the help of the earth and the sun, brought back to life all the wondrous things that the sun had destroyed, and they grew and thrived. And that night, when the sun had gone to sleep, Methal gathered the glowing earth around his bed, and formed into a sphere to be placed in the sky, a pale reflection of the sun's true glory. From the tale of Mithal's touch, as told by Gisharal, keeper of the Ralafarin clan of the Dalish elves. Silas, the Herald Keeper Silas, the Herald Keeper, is seen as the sister of Andrew the Huntress. When while Andrew loved to run with the creatures of the wild, Silas preferred to stay by her tr home tree, occupying herself with gentle arts and song. It is Silas who gave us fire and taught us how to use it. It is Silas who showed us how to heal with herbs and magic, and how to ease the passage of infants into this world. And again, it is Silas who showed us how to spin the fibers of plants into thread and rope. We owe much to Silas, and that is why we sing to her when we kindle the fires and when we put them out. That is why we sprinkle our aravels with Silas' fragrant tree moss, and ask that she protect them and all within. As told by Gizhara, keeper of the Ralafarin clan of the Dalish Elves. The Aeonar When the Imperium occupied the, that area, that is present-day Ferelden, they had two sites dedicated to magical experimentation at the extreme ends of the Imperial Highway. The southern one was the fortress of Ostagar, which looked out over the Korkari wilds. The northern one was Aeonar, although the exact location is now a secret known only to a handful of Templars. Whatever it was that the winter were trying to discover at Aeonar, their work was never completed. The fortress was overrun by disciples of Andraste upon hearing the news of her death. According to legend, it was a massacre, eerily silent, for the invaders caught the mages while all but one of them were in the fade. The site was left structurally sound by spiritually damaged. Possibly because of this, the Chantry chose to put it out of, put it to use as a prison. Accused Maleficarum and apostates are held in the confines of the Aeonar. Those who have powerful connection to the fate and particularly to demons will inevitably attract something across the veil, making the guilty somewhat easier to tell from the innocent. From Of Fires, Circles and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar. Andraste, Bride of the Maker There was once a tiny fishing village of the Waking Sea that was set upon by the Tevinter Imperium, which enslaved the villagers to be sold in the markets of Menrathus, leaving behind only the old and the infirm. One of the captives was the child Andraste. She was raised in slavery in a foreign land. She escaped, then made the long and treacherous journey back to her homeland alone. She rose from nothing to be the wife of an Alamari warlord. Each day she sang to the gods, asking them to help her people who remained slaves in Tevinter. The false gods of the mountains and the winds did not answer her, but the true god did. The Maker spoke. He showed her all the works of his hands, the Fade, the world, and all the creatures therein. He showed her how men had forgotten him, lavishing devotion upon mute idols and demons, and how he had left them to their fate. But her voice had reached him, and so captivated him that he offered her a place at his side, that she might rule all of creation. But Andraste would not forsake her people. She begged the Maker to return, to save his children from the cruelty of the Imperium. Reluctantly, the Maker agreed to give men another chance. Andraste went back to her husband, Matherath, 
and told him all that the maker had revealed to her. Together they rallied the Alamari and marched forth against the mage lords of the Imperium, and the maker was with them. The maker's sword was creation itself, fire and blood, famine and earthquake. Everywhere they went, and just they sang to the people of the maker, and they heard her. The ranks of Andraste followers grew until they were a vast tide washing over the Imperium. And when Matherab saw that the people loved Andraste and not him, a worm grew within his heart, gnawing upon it. At last the armies of Andraste and Matherab stood before the very gates of Menrathus, but Andraste was not with them, for Matherab had schemed in secret to hand Andraste over to the Tevinter. For this, the Archon would give Matherov all the lands to the south of the Waking Sea. And so, before all the armies of the Alamari and, the and of Tevinter, Andraste was tied to a stake and burned while her earthly husband turned his armies aside and did nothing, for his heart had been devoured. But as he watched the pyre, the Archon softened. He took pity on Andraste and drew his sword and granted her the mercy of a quick death. The maker wept for his beloved, cursed Matherav, cursed mankind for their betrayal, and turned once again from creation, taking only Andraste with him. And Our Lady sits still at his side, where she still urges him to take pity on his children. From the Sermons of Justinia II The Rite of Annulment In the 83rd year of the Glory Age, one of the mages of the Navarran Circle was found practicing forbidden magic. The Templars executed him swiftly, but this brewed discontent among the Navarra Circle. The mages made several magical attacks against the Templars, vengeance for the executed mage, but the Knight Commander was unable to track down which were responsible. Three months later, the mages summoned a demon and turned it loose against the Third Templar Watchers. Demons, however, are not easily controlled. After killing the first wave of Templars who tried to contain it, the demon took possession of one of its summoners. The resulting abomination slaughtered Templars and mages both before escaping into the countryside. The Grand Cleric sent a legion of Templars to hind the fugitive. They killed the abomination a year later, but by that time it had slain 70 people. Divine Galatea, responding to the catastrophe in Navarra and hoping to prevent further incidents, granted all the Grand Clerics of the Chantry the power to purge a circle entirely if they rule it irredeemable. This rite of annulment has been performed 17 times in the last 700 years. From Of Fires, Circles and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry By Sister Patrine, Chantry Scholar Apostates. It is not uncommon for the neophyte to mistake apostates and maleficarum as one and the same. Indeed, the chantry has gone to great lengths over the centuries to establish that it is so. The truth, however, is that while an apostate is often a maleficar, he need not be so. A maleficar is a mage who employs forbidden knowledge such as blood magic and the summoning of demons whereas an apostate is merely any mage who does not fall under the auspices of the Circle of Magi, and therefore the Chantry. They are hunted by the Templars, and quite often will, they will turn to forbidden knowledge in order to survive, but it would be a lie to say that all apostates begin that way. Historically, apostates become such in one of two ways. They are either mages who have escaped from the Circle, or mages who, have, who were never part of it to begin with. This latter category includes what we tend to refer to as hedge mages, those with magical ability out in the hinterlands who follow a different magical tradition than our own. Some of these hedge mages are not even aware of their nature. Undeveloped, their abilities can express themselves in a variety of ways, which the hedge mage might attribute to faith, or will, or to another being entirely depending on his nature. Some of these traditions are passed down from generation to generation, as with the so-called witches of the chastened wilders or the shamans of the Avar barbarians. 
No matter how a mage has become apostate, the Chantry treats them alike. Templars begin a systematic hunt to bring the apostates to justice. In almost all cases, justice is execution. If there is some overriding reason that mage should live, the right of tranquility is employed instead. Whether we of the Merc Circle of Magi believe this system fair is irrelevant. It is what it is. From Patterns Within Form by Halden, First Enchanter of Stark Haven, 880 Blessed. The Black City No traveler to the fate can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of this ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible. Always far off, for it seems that the only rule of geography in the fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. The chant teaches that the Black City was once the seat of the Maker, from whence he ruled the fade, left empty when men turned away from him. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful magister lords from the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black, which was, perhaps, the least of their worries. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons, by Enchanter Mendromel the Chant of Light, the Blight No matter the power, their triumphs, the mage lords of the winter were men, and doomed to die. Then a voice whispered within their hearts, Shall you surrender your power to time like the beasts of the fields? You are the lords of the earth. Go forth and claim the empty throne of heaven and be gods. In secrecy they worked magic upon magic, all their power and all their vanity, they turned against the veil, until at last it gave way. Above them a river of light, before them the throne of heaven, waiting, beneath their feet the footprints of the Maker, and all around them echoed a vast silence. But when they took a single step toward the empty throne, a great voice cried out, shaking the very foundations of heaven and earth. And so is the golden city blackened, with each step you take in my hall. Marvel at perfection, for it is fleeting. You have brought sin to heaven, and doom upon all the world. Violently were they cast down, for no mortal may walk bodily in the realm of their dreams. Bearing the mark of their crime, bodies so maimed and distorted that none shall see them and know them for men. Deep into the earth they fled, away from the light. In darkness eternal they searched for those who had goaded them on, until at last they found their prize, their god, their betrayer, the sleeping dragon Dumat. Their taint twisted even the false god, and the Whisperer awoke at last, in pain and horror, and led them to wreak havoc upon all the nations of the world. The First Blight From Frenodis Eight. The Commandments of the Maker These truths the Maker has revealed to me. As there is but one world, one life, one death, there is but one God, and He is our Maker. They are sinners who have given their love to false gods. Magic exists to serve man and never to rule over him. Foul and corrupt are they who take, have taken his gift and turned it against his children. They shall be named Maleficar, accursed ones. They shall find no rest in this world or beyond. All men are the work of our Maker's hands from the lowest slaves to the highest of kings. Those who bring harm, without provocation to the least of his children, are hated and accursed by the Maker. Those who bear false witness and work to deceive others know this. There is but one truth. All things are known to our Maker, and he shall judge their lies. 
all things in this world are, are finite. What one man gains, another has lost. Those who steal from their brothers and sisters do harm to their livelihood and to their peace of mind. Our Maker sees this with a heavy heart. Transfigurations 1, 1 to 5 The Maker There was no word for heaven and or for earth, for sea or sky. All that existed was silence. Then the voice of the Maker rang out, the first word, and his word became old that might be, dream and unyea, hope and fear. And he said to them, In my image I forge you, to you I give dominion over all that exists, by your will may all things be done. Then in the center of heaven he called forth a city with gold, towers of gold, streets with music for cobblestones, and banners which flew without wind. There he dwelled, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. The children of the Maker gathered before his golden throne, and sang hymns of praise unending. But their songs were the songs of the cobblestones, they shone with the golden light reflected from the Maker's throne. They held forth the banners that flew on their own. And the voice of the Maker shook the fate, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists, but your will, all th things, are done. Yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. And he knew he'd he had wrought amiss. So the Maker turned from his firstborn, and took from the fate a measure of its living flesh, and placed it apart from the spirits, and spoke to it, saying, Here I decree, Opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer, for darkness, light. By my will alone is balance sundered, and the world given new life. And no longer was it formless ever changing, but held fast, immutable. With words for heaven and for earth, sea and sky, at last did the Maker from the living world make man, immutable as the substance of the earth, with souls made of dream and an idea, hope and fear, endless possibilities. Then the Maker said, To you, my second-born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all-consuming and never satisfied. From the fade I crafted you, and to the fade you shall return, each night in dreams that you may always remember me. And then the Maker sealed the gates of the golden city, and there he dwelt, waiting to see the wonders his children would create. Trinities 5, 1-8 The Chant of Light Redemption Many are those who wander in sin, despairing that they are lost forever. But the one who repents, who has faith, Unshaken by the darkness of the world, and boasts not, nor gloats, over the misfortunes of the weak, but takes delight in the Maker's law and creations, she shall know the peace of the Maker's benediction. The light shall lead her safely through the paths of this world, and into the next. For she who trusts in the Maker, fire is her water, as the moth sees light and goes towards the flame, she should see fire and go towards light. The veil holds no uncertainty for her, and she will know no fear of death, for the Maker shall be her beacon and her shield, her foundation and her sword. From Transfigurations 10 The Imperial Chantry there are those who would tell you that the Chantry is the same everywhere as it is here, that the Divine and Val Royale reigns supreme in the eyes of the Maker, and that this fact is unquestioned for our Thedas. Do not believe it. The Maker's second commandment, magic must serve man, not rule over him, never held the same meaning within the ancient Avinter Imperium as it does 
elsewhere. The Chantry there interpreted the rule as meaning that mages should never control the minds of other men, and that otherwise their magic should benefit the rulers of men as much as possible. When the clerics of Teventer altered the chant of light to reflect this interpretation of the commandment, the divine in Val Royale ordered the clerics to revert to the original chant. They refused, claiming corruption within Val Royale, an argument that grew until, in 387 Towers, the chantry in Teventer elected its own legitimate and uncorrupted divine Val Hale who was not only male, but also happened to be one of the most prominent members of the Tevinter Circle of the Magi. This black divine was reviled outside Tevinter, his existence an offense to the Chantry in Val Royal. After four exalted marches to dislodge these rebels, all that the Chantry in Val Royal accomplished was to cement the separation. While most aspects of the Imperial Chantry's teachings are the same, Prohibitions against magic have been weakened, and male priests have become more prevalent. The Circle of the Magi today rules the winter directly, ever since the Archon Nomoran was elected in 734 Storm, directly from the ranks of the Enchanters. The great applause from the public. He dispensed with the old rules forbidding mages from taking part in politics, and within a century, the true rulers within the various imperial houses, the mages, took their places openly within the government. The imperial divine is now always drawn from the ranks of the first enchanters and operates as divine and grand enchanter both. This is utter heresy to any member of the chantry outside of Tevinter, a return to the days of the magisters, which brought the blights up down upon us, but it exists and even though we have left the Teventer Imperium to the mercies of the Dread Kunari, still they have endured. Further confrontation between the Black Divine and our so-called White Divine is inevitable. From Edicts of the Black Divine by Father David of Carinus, 8.11, blessed. Chantry Hierarchy The Divine is the titular head of the Chantry. Although since the schism split the imperial chantry into its own faction, there are now in fact two divines at any one time. One divine, informally called the White Divine, is a woman housed in the Grand Cathedral in Val Royale. The other, known as the Black Divine, is a man housed in the Argent Spire in Menrathus. Neither divine recognizes the existence of the other, and the informal names are considered sacrilegious. No matter the gender, a divine is addressed as most holy or your perfection. Beneath the rank of divine is the grand cleric. Each grand cleric presides over numerous chantries and represents the highest religious authority for the region. They travel to Val Royale when the College of Clerics convenes, but otherwise remain where they are assigned. All grand clerics are addressed as your grace. Beneath the grand cleric is the mother, or in, in the imperial chantry, the father. If a mother is in charge of a particular chantry, revered is appended to her title. These are the priests responsible for administering to the spiritual well-being of their flock. A mother or revered mother is addressed as your reverence. Brothers and sisters from the rank and file of the chantry and consist of three main groups. Affirmed initiates and clerics. Affirmed are the lay brethren of the chantry, those regular folk who have turned to the chantry for succor. Often they are people who have led a difficult or irreligious life and have chosen to go into seclusion, or even orphans and similar unfortunates who, have, who were raised into the chantry life. The affirmed take care of the chantry and are in turn afforded a life of quiet contemplation. No questions asked. Only those folk who, who take vows become initiates. These are men and women in training, whether in academic knowledge or the martial skills of a warrior. All initiates receive an academic education, although only those who seek to become Templars learn how to fight in addition. Clerics are the true academics of the Chantry those men and women who have dedicated themselves to the pursuit of knowledge. 
they are often found in chantry archives, sages presiding over libraries of books and arcane knowledge. The most senior of these clerics, placed in charge of such archives, are given the title elder, although such a rank is still beneath that of a mother. All other brothers and sisters are addressed simply by noting their title before their name, such as Brother Genetivi, from a guide for ambassadors from Iran. Templars Often portrayed as stoic and grim, the Order of Templars was created as the martial arm of the Chantry. Armed with the ability to dispel and resist magic, in addition to their formidable combat talents, the Templars are uniquely qualified to act as both a foil for apostates, mages who refuse to submit to the authority of the Circle, and a first line of defense against the dark powers of blood mages and abominations. While mages often resent the Templars as symbols of the Chantry's control over magic, the people of Thedas see them as saviors and holy warriors, champions of all that is good, armed with the piety enough to protect the world from the ravages of foul magic. In reality, the Chantry's militant arm looks first for skilled warriors with unshakable faith in the Maker, with a flawless moral center as a secondary concern. Templars must carry out their duty with an emotional distance, and the Order of Templars prefers soldiers with religious fervor and absolute loyalty over paragons of virtue who might question orders when it comes time to make difficult choices. The Templars' power derives from the substance Lyrian, a mineral believed to be the raw element of creation. While mages use lyrium in their arcane spells and rituals, Templars ingest the primordial mineral to enhance their abilities to resist and dispel magic. Lyrium use is regulated by the Chantry, but some Templars suffer from lyrium addiction, the effects of which include paranoia, obsession, and dementia. Templars knowingly submit themselves to this treatment in the service of the Order and the Maker. Is this sense of ruthless piety that most frightens mages when they draw the Templar's attention? When the Templars are sent to a limited, a possible blood mage, there is no reasoning with them, and if the Templars are prepared, the mages, the mages' magic is all but useless. Driven by their faith, the Templars are one of the most feared and respected forces in Thedas. From Patterns Within Form by Haldem First Enchanter of Scar Starhaven, 880 Blessed. The Founding of the Chantry Cordillus Dragon, king of the city-state of Verlay, was a man of uncommon ambition. In the year minus fifteen ancient, the young king began construction of a great temple dedicated to the Maker, and declared they that by its completion he would not only have united the warring city-states of the south, he would have brought Andrastian belief to the world. In minus three ancient, the temple was completed. There, in its heart, Draken knelt before the eternal flame of Andraste, and was crowned ruler of the empire of Orle. His first act as emperor to declare the Chantry as the established Andrastian religion of the Empire. It took three years and several hundred votes before Olesa of Montsimard was elected to lead the new Chantry. Upon her coronation as divine, she took the name Justinia, in honor of the disciple who recorded Andraste's songs. In that moment, the ancient era ended and the divine age began. From Feraldan, Folklore and History, by Sister Petrie, Chantry Scholar. The Fraternity of Enchanters Another aspect of circle life is the fraternity. When a mage becomes an enchanter, he may ally himself with a fraternity. These are cliques that cross circle boundaries, mages of common interests and goals who band together to ensure that their voice is heard within the College of Magi in Cumberland. The largest fraternities currently are the Loyalists, who advocate loyalty and obedience to the Chantry, the Equitarians, who 
who advocate temperance and follow a distinct code on, of conduct which they believe all mages should hold themselves to. The Libertarians, a growing fraternity publicly maintaining greater power for the circles but secretly advocating a complete split from the country. A dangerous opinion, naturally. The Isolationists, a small group that advocates withdrawing to remote territories in order to avoid conflicts with the general populace. The Lucrasians, who maintain that the circle must do what it is profitable, first and foremost. They prioritize the accumulation of wealth, with the gaining of political influence a close second. So far, an alliance between the Loyalists and the Equitarians has prevented the Libertarians from gaining much headway. But there are signs that the Equitarians may throw their support in with the Libertarians. If that happens, many mages predict it will come to civil war among the circles. From the Circle of Magi, a history by First Enchanter Josephus. Hierarchy of the Circle It is no simple matter safeguarding ordinary men from mages, and mages from themselves. Each circle tower must have some measures of self-government, for it is ever the maker's will that men be given the power to take responsibility for our own actions, to sin and fail, as well as to achieve the highest grace and glory on our own strength. You, who will be tasked with the protection of the circle, must be aware of its workings. The first enchanter is the heart of any tower. He will determine the course his circle will take, he will choose which apprentices may be tested and made full mages, and you will work most closely with him. Assisting the first enchanter will be the senior enchanters, a small council of the most trusted and experienced magi in the tower. From this group, the next first enchanter is always chosen. Beneath the council are the enchanters. These are the teachers and mentors of the tower and you must get to know them in order to keep your finger on the pulse of the circle, for the enchanters will always know what it is happening among the children. All those who have passed their harrowing but have not taken apprentices are mages. This is where most trouble in a circle lies, in the idleness and experience of youth. The untested apprentices are the most numerous denizens of any tower, but they are more often posed threat to themselves, due to their lack of training, than to anyone else. Knight Commander Seren of the Chantry Templars, in a letter to his successor. History of the Circle It is a truth universally acknowledged that nothing is more successful at inspiring a person to mischief as being told not to do something. Unfortunately, the Chantry of the Divine Age had some trouble with obvious truths. Although it did not outlaw magic, quite the contrary, as the Chantry relied upon magic to kindle the eternal flame which burns in every brazier in every Chantry, it relegated mages to lighting candles and lamps, perhaps occasional dusting of rafters and eaves. I will give my readers a moment to contemplate how well such a role satisfied the mages of the time. It surprised absolutely no one when the mages of Valrio, in protest, snapped the sacred flames of the cathedral and barricaded themselves inside the choir loft. No one, that is, but divine Ambrosia II, who was outraged and attempted to order an exalted march upon her own cathedral. Even her most devout Templars discouraged that idea. For twenty-one days the fires remained unlit while negotiations were conducted legend tells us, by shouting back and forth from the loft. The mages went cheerily into exile in a remote fortress outside of the capital, where they would be kept under the watchful eye of the Templars and a council of their own elder magi. Outside of normal society and outside of the chantry, the mages would form their closed society, the circle separated for the first time in human history. From Off Fires, Circles and Templars, A History of Magic in the Chantry, by Sister Petrie, Chantry Scholar. The Fate The study of the Fate is as old as humankind. For so long as men have dreamed, we have walked its twisting paths, 
sometimes catching a glimpse of the city at its heart. Always as close as our own thoughts, but impossibly separated from our own world. The Tevinter Imperium once spent vast fortunes of gold, lyrium and human slaves in an effort to map the terrain of the fate, an ultimately futile endeavor. Although portions of it belong to powerful spirits, all of the fate is now in constant flux. The Imperium succeeded in finding the desperate and ever-shifting realms of a dozen demon lords, as well as cataloging a few hundred types of spirits, before they were forced to abandon the project. The relationship of dreamers to the fate is complex. Even when entering the fate through the use of lyrium, mortals are not able to control or affect it. The spirits who dwell there, however, can, and as the Chantry teaches us, the great flaw of the spirits is that they have neither imagination nor ambition. They create what they see through their sleeping visitors, building elaborate copies of our cities, people and events which, like the reflections in a mirror, ultimately lack context or life of their own. Even the most powerful demons merely plagiarize the worst thoughts and fears of mortals, and build their realms with no other ambition than to taste life. From Tranquility and the Role of the Fate in Human Culture by First Enchanter Josephus The Harrowing Among apprentices of the circle, nothing is regarded with more fear than the harrowing. Little is known about this rite of passage, and that alone would be cause for dread. But it is well understood that only those apprentices who pass this trial are ever seen again. They return as full members of the circle of Magi. Of those who fail, nothing is known. Perhaps they are sent away in disgrace. Perhaps they are killed on the spot. I heard one patently ridiculous rumor among the circle at Ravain which claimed that failed apprentices were transformed into pigs, fattened up and served to dinner to the senior enchanters. But I could find no evidence that the Ravani circle ate any particular quantity of pork. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, by Brother Genetivi. Lyrium. More than half of wealth of Orzumar comes from a single, extremely rare substance. Lyrium. The Chantry believes it to be the waters of the Fade, mentioned in the Canticles of Trinities, the very stuff of creation itself, from whence the Maker fashioned the world. Only a handful of mining caste families hazard extracting the ore, finding veins in the stone quite literally by ear. For in its raw form, Lyrium sings, and the discerning can hear the sound even through solid rock. Even though dwarves have a natural resistance, raw lyrium is dangerous for all but the most experienced of the mining castes to handle. Even for dwarves, exposure to the unprocessed mineral can cause deafness or memory loss. For humans and elves, direct contact with lyrium ore produces nausea, blistering of the skin and dementia. Mages cannot even approach unprocessed lyrium. Doing so is invariably fatal. Despite its dangers, Lyrium is the single most valuable mineral currently known. In the Tevinter Imperium, it has been known to command a higher price than diamond. The dwarves sell very little of the processed mineral to the surface, giving the greater portion of what they mine to their own smiths, who use it in the forging of all truly superior dwarven weapons and armor. What processed lyrium is sold on the surface goes only to the Chantry, who strictly control the supply. From the Chantry it is dispensed both to the Templars who make use of it in tracking and fighting Maleficarum and to the Circle. In the hands of the Circle, Lurium reaches its fullest potential. Therefore Maori craftsmen transform it into an array of useful items from the practical, such as magically hardened stone for construction, to the legendary silver armor of King Kalenhad. When mixed into liquid and ingested, lyrium allows mages to enter the fade when fully aware, unlike all others who reach it only when dreaming. Such potions can also be used to aid in the casting of especially taxing spells, for a short time granting a mage far greater power than he normally wields. Lyrium has its costs, however. 
prolonged use becomes addictive, the cravings unbearable. Over time, Templars grow disoriented and capable of distinguishing memory from present or dream from waking. They frequently become paranoid, as their worst memories and nightmares haunt their waking hours. Mages have additionally been known to suffer a physical mutation. The Magister Lords of the Tevinter Imperium were widely reputed to have been so affected by their years of lyrium use that they could not be recognized by their own kin, nor even as creatures that have been once human. From In Pursuit of Knowledge The Travels of a Chantry Scholar by Brother Jim Thibi Maleficarum It has been asked, what are Maleficarum? How shall we know them? I have been as troubled by this question as you. You have come to me for the wisdom of the Maker, but none have seen the Maker's heart saved beloved and trusty. And so I have done as all mortals must, and looked to the words of his prophet for answers. And there I found respite from a troubled mind. For she has said to us, Magic exists to serve man, and never to rule over him. Therefore I say to you, they who work magic which dominates the minds and hearts of others, they have transgressed the Maker's law. Also, Our Lady said to us, those who bring harm without provocation to the least of his children are hated and accursed by the Maker. And so it is made clear to me, as it should be to us all, that magic which fuels itself by harming others, by the letting of blood, is hated by the Maker. Those mages who honor the Maker and keep his laws we welcome as our brothers and sisters. Those who reject the laws of the Maker and the words of his prophet are apostate. They shall be cast out, and given no place among us. From the Sermons of Justinia I Mana and the Use of Magic Mana is that which defines a mage. It is potential that dwells within a person, but does not always manifest itself. All men are connected to the fate. We go there to dream. But only those with this potential may draw upon its power. Mana is, then, a measurement of one's ability to draw power from the fate, and it is this power that it is expended in magic. As in all other things, it has limits. Just as a man has the strength to lift only so much weight and no more, a mage cannot work more magic at one time than his mana allows. If he wishes to work magic that would be beyond his strength, a mage must bustle his mana with lyrium. Without lyrium, it is possible for the reckless to expend their own life force in the working of magic. And occasionally ambitious apprentices endure or even kill themselves by overexertion. From the lectures of First and Chander Wenceslas. Demonic Possession Why do demons seek to possess the living? History claims that they are malevolent spirits, the first children of the Maker, angry at their creator for turning for them and jealous of those creations he considers superior. They stare across the veil at the living and do not understand what they see, yet they know they crave it, they desire life, they pull the living across the veil, when they sleep and prey on their psyche with nightmares. Whenever they can, they cross the veil into our world to possess it outright. We know that any demon will seek to possess a mage, and upon doing so will create an abomination. Most of the world does not know, however, that the strength of an abomination depends entirely on the power of the demon that possesses the mage. This is true, in fact, of all possessed creatures. One demon is not the same as any other. Demons can, for instance, be classified. Enchanter Brahm's categorization of demons into that portion of the psyche that they primarily prey upon has held since the Tower Age. According to Brahm, the weakest and most common of demons are those of rage. They are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts against the living. They expand their energies quickly, the most powerful of them exhibiting great strength and occasionally the ability to generate fire. Next are the demons of hunger. In a living host they become cannibals and vampires, and within the dead they feed upon the living. Theirs are the powers of draining, both of life force and of mana. Next are the demons of sloth. 
the first on Brahms' scale that are capable of true intelligence. In its true form, this demon is known as a shade, a thing which is nearly indistinct and invisible, for such is sloth's nature. It hides and stalks, unaware, and when confronted, it sows fatigue and apathy. Demons of desire are amongst the most powerful, and are the ones most likely to seek out the living and actively trick them into a deal. These demons will exploit anything that can be coveted, wealth, power, lust, and they will always end up getting far more than they give. A desire demon's province is that of illusions and mind control. Strongest of all demons are those of pride. These are the most feared creatures to lose upon the world. Masters of magic and in possession of vast intellect, they are the true schemers. It is they who seek most strongly to possess mages, and will bring other demons across the veil and numbers to achieve their own ends, although what that might be has never been discovered. A greater pride demon brought across the veil would threaten the entire world. From the Maker's First Children by Bader, Senior Enchanter of Ostwick, 812 Blessed. The Cardinal Rules of Magic You must not be under the misimpression that magic is all-powerful. There are limits, and not even the greatest mages may overcome them. No one, for instance, has found any means of traveling either over great distances or even small ones, beyond putting one foot in front of the other. The immutable nature of the physical world prevents this. So no, you may not simply pop over to Minerthus to borrow a cup of sugar, nor you may magic the essay you forgot, the NTM pred this dormitory to your desk. You will simply have to be prepared. Similarly, even when you send your mind into the fate, your body remains behind. Only once has this barrier been overcome, and repeatedly the spell required two-thirds of the Lyrium and the Winter Imperium as well as the lifeblood of several hundred slaves. Their results were utterly disastrous. Finally, life is finite. A truly great healer may bring someone back from the very precipice of death, when breath and heartbeat have ceased but the spirit still clings to life. But once the spirit has fled the body, it cannot be recalled. That is no failing of your skills or power, it is simple reality. From the lectures of First Enchanter Wenzelus. Blood Magic, the Forbidden School Foul and corrupt are you who have taken my gift and turned it against my children. Transfigurations, 1810 The ancient Tevinters did not originally consider blood magic a school of its own. Rather, they saw it as a means to achieve greater power in any school of magic. The name, of course, refers to the fact that the magic of this type uses life, specifically in the form of blood, instead of mana. It was common practice, at one time, for a magister to keep a number of slaves one hand to so, so that, should he undertake the working of a spell that was physically beyond his capabilities, he could use the blood of his slaves to bolster the costing. Over time, however, the Imperium discovered types of spells that could only be worked by blood. Although Lyrium will allow a mage to send his conscious mind into the Fade, blood would allow him to find the sleeping minds of others, view their dreams and even influence or dominate their thoughts. Just as treacherous, blood magic allows the veil to be opened completely so that demons may physically pass through into our world. The rise of the Chant of Light and the subsequent fall of the old Imperium has led to blood magic being all but stamped out. As it should be, for it poses nearly as great a danger to those who would practice it as to the world at large. From the Four Schools A Treatise by First and Chandler Josephus. The Four Schools of Magic Creation Opposition in all things, for earth, sky, for winter, summer. For darkness, light. By my will alone is balance sundered, and the world given new life. Frenodies 5.5 five. The school of creation, sometimes called the school of nature, is the second of the schools of matter, the balancing force and complement of entropy. Creation magic manipulates natural forces, transforming what exists and bringing new things into being. 
creation requires considerable finesse, more than any other school, and is therefore rarely mastered. Those mages who have made a serious study of creation are the highest in demand, useful in times of peace as well as war. From The Four Schools A Treatise by Hearst and Chanter Josephus. The Four Schools of Magic Entropy To you, my second born, I grant this gift. In your heart shall burn an unquenchable flame, all consuming and never satisfied. Friendlies 5 7. The first of the two schools of matter entropy is the opposing force of creation. For this reason, it is often called the school of negation. Nothing lives without death. Time inevitably brings an end to all things in the material world, and yet in this ending is the seed of a beginning. A river may flood its banks, causing havoc, but bring new life to its floodplain. The fire that burns a forest ushers in new growth. And so it is with entropic magic that we manipulate the forces of erosion, decay, and destruction to create anew. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. The Four Schools of Magic Primal Those who oppose thee shall know the wrath of heaven. Field and forest shall burn. The seas shall rise and devour them. The wind shall tear their nations. From the face of the earth. Lightning shall rain down from the sky. They shall cry out to their false gods and find silence. Andraste 7.19 Sometimes called the school of power, the primal school is the second of the schools of energy, balanced by spirit and concerns the most visible and tangible forces of nature itself. This is the magic of war, fire, ice and lightning devastation. This is what the vast majority imagines when they hear the word magic. From the Four Schools, a treatise by Enchanter Josephus. The Four Schools of Magic. Spirit. And the voice of the Maker shook the fate, saying, In my image I have wrought my firstborn. You have been given dominion over all that exists. By your will all things are done. Yet you do nothing. The realm I have given you is formless, ever-changing. Threnodes 5.4 The first of the two schools of energy, spirit is opposed by the primal school. It is the school of mystery, the ephemeral school. This is the study of the invisible energies which surround us all, at all times, yet are outside of nature. It is from the fate itself that this magic draws its power. Students of this school cover everything from direct manipulation of mana and spell energies to the study and summoning of spirits themselves. By its nature, an esoteric school, as most others know virtually nothing about the fate, studies of spirit magic are often misunderstood by the general populace, or even confused for blood magic, an unfortunate fate for a most useful branch of study. From the Four Schools, a treatise by First Enchanter Josephus. Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons It is challenging enough for the casual observer to tell the difference between the fate and the creatures that live within it, let alone between one type of spirit and another. In truth, there is little that distinguishes them, even for the most astute mages, since spirits are not physical entities and are therefore not restricted to rec recognizable forms, or even having a form at all. One can never tell for certain what is alive and what is merely part of the scenery. It is therefore advisable for the inexperienced researcher to greet all objects he encounters. Typically, we misuse the term spirit to refer only to the benign, or at least less malevolent, creatures of the fate. But in truth, all that denies all the denizens of the realm beyond the veil are spirits. As the chant of light notes, everything within the fade is a mimicry of our world, a poor imitation, for the spirits do not remotely understand what they are coping. It is no surprise that much of the fade appears like a manuscript translated from the winter into a religion and back again by Draken initiates. In general, spirits are not complex. 
or rather, they are not complex as we understand such things. Each one seizes upon a single facet of human experience – rage, hunger, compassion, hope, etc. This one idea becomes their identity. We classify as demons those spirits who identify themselves with darker human emotions and ideas. The most common and weakest form of demon one encounters in the Fade is the Rage Demon. They are much like perpetually boiling kotos. For they exist only to vent hatred, but rarely have an object to hate. Somewhat above these are the Hunger Demons, who do little but eat or attempt to eat everything they encounter, including other demons. This is rarely successful. Then there are the Sloth Demons. These are the first intelligent creatures one typically finds in the Fade. They are dangerous only on those rare occasions that they can be induced to get up and do harm. Desire demons are more clever and far more powerful, using all forms of bribery to induce mortals into their realms. Wealth, love, vengeance, whatever lies closest to your heart. The most powerful demons yet encountered are the pride demons perhaps because they, among all their kind, most resemble men. From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons, by Enchanter Mildrumel. The Tranquil If the Warden is a Mage Although apprentices do not know the nature of the harrowing, all of them understand its consequences. They either pass and become full mages, or they are never seen again those who fear to undertake this rite of passage, or those who are deemed weak or unstable, are given the right of tranquility instead. The actual procedure, like the harrowing, is a secret, but the results are just as well known. The rite serves connections to the fate. The tranquil, therefore, do not dream. This removes the greatest danger that threatens a weak and or unprepared mage the potential to attract demons across the veil. But this is the least of tranquility's effects. For the absence of dreams brings with it the end of all magical ability, as well as all emotion. The tranquil, ironically, resembles sleepwalkers, never entirely awake or asleep. They are still part of our circle, however, and some might say they are the most critical part. They have incredible powers of concentration, for it is simply impossible to distract a tranquil mage, and this makes them capable of becoming craftsmen of such skill that they rival even with adeptness of the dwarves. The formari, the branch of the circle devoted to item enchantment, is made up exclusively of tranquil, and is the source of all the wealth that sustains our towers. From On Tranquility and the Role of the Fade in Human Society by First Enchanter Josephus If the Warden is not a mage The Tranquil are the least understood but most visible members of the circle. Every city of respectable size boasts a circle of magi shop, and every one of these shops is run by a Tranquil proprietor. The name is a misnomer, for they are not Tranquil at all. Rather, they are like inanimate objects that speak. If a table wished to sell you an enchanted penknife, it could pass as one of these people. Their eyes are expressionless, their voices monotone. Incomparable craftsmen they might be, but they are hardly the sort of mages to put ordinary folk at ease. From In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, by Brother Gen TV. The Sacred Ashes of Andraste only one person witnessed Mathura's betrayal, Havard the Aegis. A childhood friend of Matharath, he accompanied his chief to the meeting with the Tevinters, not realizing what was planned. When he understood that Matharath was given Andraste over to be executed, Havard, unwilling to draw swords against his friend and leash, placed himself between Andraste and the Tevinter soldiers. The Tevinters struck him down, and Matharath left him for dead. Gravely wounded, Havard made his way to the gates of Minrathus to stop the execution. When he reached it, the terrible deed was already done, the armies on the plains long since dispersed. Havard, cursed with weakness, gathered the earthly remains of Andraste that had been left to the wind and rain, and wept.
when his fingers touched the pile of ash. His ears filled with song, and he saw before him a vision of Andraste, dressed in cloth made of starlight. She knelt at his side, saying, The Maker shall never forget you, so long as I remember. The song faded and the vision with it, and Havard was alone, but his wounds were healed. With new strength, Havard took up the ashes of Our Lady and bore them back to the lands of the Alamari. From Thedas, Myths and Legends, by Brother Genetivi The Veil I detest this notion that the veil is some manner of invisible curtain that separates the world of the living from the world of the spirits. Whether it be called the fade or the beyond is a matter of racial politics I refuse to indulge in at the moment. There is no this side and that side when it comes to the veil. One cannot think of it as a physical thing or a barrier, or even as a shimmering wall of holy light. Thank you very much for that image, your perfection. Think of the veil instead as opening one's eyes. Before you open them, you saw our world as you see it now, static, solid and unchanging. Now that they are open, you see our world as the spirits see it, chaotic, ever-changing, a realm where the imagined and the remembered have as much substance as that which is real. More, in fact. A spirit sees everything as defined by will and memory, and this is why they are so very lost when they cross the veil. In our world, imagination has no substance. Objects exist independently of how we remember them or what emotions we associate with them. Mages alone possess the power to change the world with their minds, and perhaps this forms the nature of a demon's attraction to them. Who can say? Regardless, the act of passing through the veil is much more about changing one's perceptions than a physical transaction. The veil is an idea, it is the act of transition itself, and it is only the fact that both living beings and spirits find the transition difficult that gives the veil any credence as a physical barrier at all. From a dissertation on the fate as a physical manifestation by Marino, senior enchanter of the Minrathos Circle of Magi, 655 Steel.